to see you all here. Um, uh, let me just, uh, oh, Pete, you started recording. Uh, should I do that again, Pete? I know yeah, I've, I may have started yes. quickly. Yep. One more time. Yep. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our meeting. Uh, it's great to see everybody. As you know, um, the state, uh, state of Connecticut and the governor's office requested this meeting as recorded. Um, again, it's great to see everybody. Um, Pete, um, as I did mention to the group, for those of you that just came on board, um, uh, Councillor Pentelo has a hard stop at one o'clock. So if we do have any questions regarding budget, um, we can, um, we'll make sure we'll get you in, Pat, uh, before one o'clock. Um, all right, Pete, why don't we get right into development uh, project updates? Okay. I'll just crank through these real quick. Uh, 61 Arrow Road, uh, property sold to a new owner. 207 Church, the uh, auction gallery, I understand, is also sold. Uh, the nursing home, 341 Jordan Lane. Uh, because of the um, continuing issues of people getting in the building and dumping there, the fire marshal has issued an order that they install a fence to block people from continuing to get into the back and around the building. So just, just be aware uh, of that uh, action. Um, let's see, uh, planning and zoning approved a new office building on Progress Drive for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, the property at the corner of Progress Drive, uh, owned by the uh, Cons, is um, was also uh, is is listed as available now. Uh, so that property is going to be for sale. And uh, believe it or not, I've been contacted by uh, self storage uh, businesses about that property. So just an FYI on that. Next Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon, we have a ribbon cutting for the Charles Restaurant. So if any of you can join us uh, at three o'clock the afternoon there, uh, please, please do that. Um, you may have noticed 1199 Silestine Highway, the former fitness building is being renovated mostly on the inside. Uh, the Gr Grand Cafe is getting ready to open in the former uh, bookstore on the Silestine Highway. Um, the unbuilt self-storage building on Arrow Road. I was um, contacted by a, an economic development consultant representing uh, a potential builder of that self-storage facility last week. So that seems to be making some progress. And then lastly, diagonally across the street here from Town Hall, the donut station uh, business is getting pretty close to um, opening up. Uh, obviously the uh, uh, Puritan Furniture, the former Puritan Furniture, they're making significant progress on the office building, um, not, not making as much progress on the, on the Chase Bank at the corner um, of Silestine Highway and uh, Mill, but um, working on that, getting that foundation. So they should start framing that shortly. And then the uh, Popeye's Chicken, if you've been by there, has made significant progress and should be opening relatively soon. I was looking at the um, uh, the plans. I actually popped in over there, and I just was I didn't say who, I, who I, anything official, and there was somebody there, and they just happened to show me the plans. But it's really kind of a nice looking building, and as you go into the Salastine Highway from Hartford, you know, if you're going to have a Popeyes chicken, be one of the first things you see as you come into Weather Weathersfield. It's a really nice design for the building, so um, that's that's good. Peter, is um, is there a hold on? Uh... The uh, hamburger place going up that Joe Sula was doing because I see a sign saying uh, available. I spoke with Joe um, Sulo a couple times in the last few weeks. He is um, he's listed the property with a broker to basically see if there's any interest from somebody uh, in that site or whether he would go forward with the plans for the for the building. But so he's put it out there, kick the tires, see if anyone's interested uh, and, and see what comes out of that. Okay. Andy? Peter, uh, the fitness building you mentioned um, is being refurbished and what would be the new purpose? There would be multiple tenants in that building. Uh, one of, I think the only tenant that's confirmed right now is a, a daycare provider. Um, they would take up, they would probably be the main tenant, but he's carved out two or three other tenant spaces. He talked about a small, maybe a small restaurant, uh, maybe some offices. He, he has not nailed down the other tenancy yet, as far as I know. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, Peter, it's Paul Thompson. Quick question on the, the donut place that's opening on the uh, near Town Hall. Is that a part of a chain or is that a uh, an individual restaurant? It's an it's a it's a mom and pop. They do have a another location. I believe it's in either Southington or Torrington, but it's a, okay. just, just one or one or two. It's in Torrington. Uh, thank you. Torrington. Okay. Yeah. And they have they have a good pretty good Facebook page if you ever go to it they're pretty good marketers. Yeah, uh, I met Peter, them last well, sorry, night. Sorry. sorry, I met them last just... night at the um, Weathersfield Chamber event. Very involved and very excited to be coming here. Yeah, that, that's why I asked. I think it's exciting to see some independent businesses in addition to the the chains that are out there coming to town. Definitely. P Peter, what's the story with Khan? Are, are they did they move or they did they go out of business or what, what's what's what happened with them? I don't know the, all the details, so I'd rather not, you know, mostly speculate. But um, so, okay. And as far as is for 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 ABC Burger, I mean, that seems like a pretty extreme move to kind of list it. Unless, I mean, has he expressed? Maybe this again is getting into details you don't want to get into, but I know the last year has been pretty hard on the restaurant business and probably on his supply business as well. And 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 I mean, is this more than just well, he just wants to see what's out there? It's like, or if it's he really needs to sell the place in order to get get something built there. And part two of the question is, how do we? Well, I won't get into it yet, but how do we? Um, I mean, my my fear is you open up that property to some other business and and and. Um, you, you might wind up getting a less attractive business yes. in that location. Yes. Well, it would, I think one of his, the building, the restaurant was almost, was over 6,000 square feet. That's a lot for a restaurant. And then you factor in what's going on with restaurants. You know, I think he's, he's kind of reassessing it. He talked to me initially about maybe a smaller version, but unfortunately it would still require him to go back through that process that he went through, which was not a, was not a pleasant uh, experience for him. So I think that, factors in on his decision making he may still come back to the original plan and still do it so i think he's looking at um, several options and obviously the uh the covid crisis uh, has not helped you know, I, know, I know that we've talked at one point um and i know that i'm i'm, I'm fairly confident you reached out but if joe has any concerns about going through the hurdles that he had in the past he needs to know that, um, you know, I'll, I'll do, and I know others here would do whatever we can to make sure that it would be smooth sailing. And again, if he's using, if it's just a smaller footprint and he's still using the same materials, that really was the hangup, I think, for the most part, was the exterior facade of that building um, that we, you know, we want to support him. But um, it, it, it's every business I know has been affected on the restaurant side. So I hope him well. I think Tom's point is a good one. Um, we knew that that was going to be a good looking facility and probably a well uh, attended uh, uh, location. Um, so we don't want to have a, you know, a big mega nail salon go in there. Nothing against nail salons, uh, but, you know, I think, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think uh, the other factor is it's, it's on his property. So obviously, whatever, if anything other than what he wants to do goes there, it's his property. He's going to be very, you know very careful about that. So uh, I guess we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, and then if uh, I, I have offered the commission's, you know, assistance, if he does go forward again and, and needs to do that. So he's, he's aware of that. Okay, great. Any other questions on project updates? Okay, Pete, update on the outreach. So as of uh, earlier this week, I think we received 55 responses to the survey. Um, so that we were gonna put out a reminder just to give it one last shot, see if we could goose it up a little bit. So the numbers uh, of 55 were not as, uh, uh, not as encouraging as I had, uh, we had hoped for the effort that we put into that. Um, so we're gonna, as I say, put another reminder out and then uh, we'll, uh, within maybe the next week or so, start tallying the responses and share those with you guys um, and then uh, discuss the next steps. How many did we send out, Pete? We sent out a little bit over a thousand. <clears throat> okay. 
um, the just so you, I mean, the return rate and stuff like that were almost probably better than the average bear, believe it or not. It's usually three, four percent. If we got in 55, you know, I hate to say it, but you don't get a lot of responses from that. I know I don't respond to any of them. So I'm part of the 98 percent or 96 percent that doesn't. Um, so but it'll be good. I mean, if we see the 55 and there's a common thread between them, then that's good. It's not a bad sampling 55. So but let's hope we get more. Uh, okay. Um, Peter, how long do you think the tax incentive, I know you're gonna uh, share a screen and do a PowerPoint just to get the group um, updated uh, on that. Um, and I wanna be mindful of uh, Councilor Penelo's one o'clock timeframe. Yep. Um, do you wanna just, um, can we bypass that? Maybe just let uh, Pat go now and then we'll go to the tax incentive. Sounds fine that with me, yep. Patrick, welcome. How are you, sir? Good. Do, do you have to open up the agenda? Is it this official? Uh, it's 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 okay. official. Um, so the um, guys, um, um, you saw that uh, Peter had forwarded to us with regards to uh, cuts. Um, if you saw um, on the positive side, which was great, the fifty thousand CIP um, amount that we had um, has been um, put into the budget, uh, and, and as you guys know. Um, revenues are, are down and expenses are up. Uh, so it's tough to hold on to things, but I think that 50,000 was, uh, was a very solid uh, ask. Um, I don't know if it's uh, that we were able to keep. The second piece was um, we have a placeholder for a secondary uh, EDIC employee um, uh, in there, which from what I understand still is in the budget and I, I believe looks good. It's not a done deal till it's a done deal, but that's still in there. Um, the council asked us to find fifteen thousand uh, dollars in cuts, um, uh, which and again I'm sure you guys viewed. Um, we proposed. I, um, Peter, and I just uh, talked. I, and I contacted um, Mike Rell and had a quick conversation, and Pat and I uh, spoke as uh, as well about potentially. Um, and I, I proposed this to the group potentially um, cutting our CIP funds, which would go towards the facade improvement by 10,000 um, and then allowing us to find uh, cuts of 5,000 somewhere in those other items, um, which included lunch and, and, and stuff like that. And um, they were comfortable with that. Um, and uh, that's where I'm at, at this point. Pat, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much uh, said it. And now that you've mentioned lunch, I feel like every time I get on one of these between always talking about donuts and fried chicken or if it's around noon, I'm always hungry after. But um, I mean, Mark Mark pretty much just, just summed it up. Um, I have been working uh, during this budget process with the mayor as well as Gary. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of a unique year because, you know, we have all these uh, funds from the federal government come in, coming in, but uh, there's not real clear guidance in how to spend them. Right. It feels like um, I, I'm sure Peter understands this. Like Gary, I deal with it almost every day with them. It seems like every day there's new guidance coming from the Treasury that says what you can and can't do with the money. So um, I know it looks like there's there, there's a fifteen thousand dollar cut. That's because there is. Uh, but keep in mind, we also had to craft the budget, assuming that the, the, the ARP funds didn't exist. Um, we are trying to be responsible, but at the same time, being mindful that even after this COVID year that things are starting to open up, people are still just getting back on their feet. So uh, with that, uh, I'll kind of just open it up to, to any questions and um, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Any questions from the group? Oh, I did forget to mention one thing too. Uh, sorry, Mark, we, we talked about it. I thought you uh, surmised it, but uh, um, there, there is some talk too, uh, Peter, maybe you can kind of elaborate on this. Uh, I don't know how far that you've talked to Gary about it, but, um, I did speak with the mayor and that part of the portions of the ARP fund, um, were, were sort of fighting to, um, carve out some of that money to implement into programs specifically to the EDIC and RDA one to give the RDA some teeth, uh, and two to keep, uh, keep, keep providing programs to, to, attract new businesses and new people to Weathersfield, specifically EDIC. So I don't know, Pete, if you've had any uh, uh, conversations with Gary regarding that, uh, some of the programs. I know I've talked to Gary briefly about it, but it seems like the money is there's so much red tape attached to it. It's hard to, to kind of navigate which specific programs we want to tackle first. 
it just in general that you know the, it seems like that that funding can't be spent on much but it potentially could be spent on some economic development initiatives we have not uh, hammered out anything specific but so um so potentially uh there could be either new programs or supplemental programs that we could use the funding for so uh um uh, but as i say uh, nothing specific to talk about yet yeah and it seems like, like I said, it seems like every week CCM puts out something, something new that you can and can't spend the money on. So right. it just continues to, but the, the beautiful thing is, is that um, you, uh, we, we are getting the part-time position uh, for the EDIC. Um, and then hopefully, uh, you know, that, uh, well, there is discussion to don't quote me on it, but um, I know that uh, we have what be three years to spend the ARP money. So maybe we can figure out. Uh, some something contractually, uh, you know, even with a, a person to bring in um, on a consulting basis to do do some creative things as well. So everything's ongoing. But if nobody else has any other questions, um, you know, I'll kind of just leave it at that for now. But um, just for an FYI, uh, the the next budget hearing I think is at six o'clock on Monday. Um, it's either six or seven, but official notice should go out uh, today or tomorrow. Thank you, Councillor Penelo. Any questions for Patrick? I think the good news, whether it happens or not, that the will is strong by leadership um, from the top down on the council on trying to find something if it's if it is possible and feasible uh, for EDIC RDA. So I think that's if we get a dollar, it's a win. Um, um, Two dollars would be a bigger win, Patrick. I think you get what I'm where I'm going. Um, any other questions for Patrick? Great, Councillor, thank you. Thank you. Um, Pete, if we want to get into the tax incentive policy. Sure, I'll, I'll uh, try and uh, crank through this. Let me just pull up uh, slides here for that. So for those of you that weren't there, the, um, the subcommittee did meet uh, last week um, and I think put a, a pretty sharp point on some uh, final aspects on what our tax incentive policy will look like going forward. Um, and, and Pete, I'll let you uh, share um, your wisdom on this. Sure. All right. Can you see the uh, slides? I can. Yes. Okay. Let me. Here we go. Um, so um, the e the EDIC uh, uh, RDA Finance Subcommittee uh, uh, has met three different times: January, February, and June, uh, and. Uh, at the last meeting in June, we had a draft of the proposed changes based on the previous meetings. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the second draft. Um, a little bit of the history of the program, so everybody's coming at this from the same page. Uh, we adopted the program way back in 2004. It has not Excuse been me, revised. Peter, what was are that? You, uh, are you forwarding the slides? Can you you can't see those or not? Um, for me, they're not moving. They're still on slide one. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, um, let me go back and see if we can restart this here. I'm on slide three on my computer, so something's going wrong here. It's the same thing on mine. It's on okay. slide. So I what, think what you have to share, I think you have to share your screen. There's a couple of screens you can click on when you share the screen. Yeah, I am uh, doing that. So I'm not sure exactly. Um, so what do you see on your screen? Just the first slide? Yes, updating Weathersfield's tax incentive program. How about now? Do you see the second slide yet? Nope. Okay. Um, if you want to just make it bigger, we can, they all are, they, can you move the ones on the left up and down? My screen is just, is just showing the one screen at a time. So we're okay. on different screens. Let me, um, let me, let me unshare and see if we can get this back again here. Sure. I always thought you were a good share, Peter. This is really kind of going. No, this, is a, this, this is a first, so um, I'm not sure what the problem is here. Um, can now? I, Mark? Uh, Peter, it Mark did move. Judy, Just move. You're good now, Pete. Looks like they're moving. Okay. So, what do you see now? January 4th. There we go. So just uh, here we go to, here's the uh, history of our program. It goes back to 2004. Um, over the period of time, we've done eight different tax agreements. Uh, two of them were 
not based on this statute. They were for the uh, AHEPA senior housing project, but we've had two multifamily projects over the years. Uh, the minimum investment so far to date has been 135,000. The maximum investment was 28 million and that's the Borden project. Uh, the minimum benefit was 30,000 a year. The maximum benefit was 100,000 a year. Uh, the shortest agreement we had was two years and then the longest agreement we had was seven years. Uh, this is the existing schedule that we have in place now. It's a little bit confusing. So one of the things we wanted to accomplish uh, was once and for all to come up with a, with a uh, specific schedule that is based on um, the, the tax agreements that we've given uh, out over the years so that we have some level of consistency. But at the end of the day, the town council can ultimately decide for themselves if they wanted to do something different. So I just wanna make that clear to everybody. These are guidelines, not necessarily um, requirements. These are the general requirements that we have in place uh, that, that right now it only applies to real property. And if a business comes to town, you know, redoes a, redoes a building, uh, starts new construction. Uh, these are the criteria that we have been looking at uh, to decide if an incentive is, um, is, is worthwhile. We do have a process in place. We, um, the applications come to our office. We have a committee that reviews them and we do have an economic development commission member who is part of that committee. Uh, we then make a recommendation to council and then council ultimately uh, will decide and enter into a written agreement. Here's a couple of examples of what we've done over the years. Uh, the smallest, uh, as we said at the beginning, was Express Dental on the Silas Dean Highway. They invested $135,000 in their building. We gave them a two-year uh, deal, and it was a 50% tax break for each of those two years. Pelton's building uh, invested $450,000. They added a bunch of jobs. Uh, we gave them a three-year deal, and it was 50% uh, per year. 1290 Silas Dean Highway um, invested $3 million in that building uh, to renovate the building. We gave them a five-year deal. And once again, it was 50%. You can see, the, you can see a trend here. Uh, 275 Ridge Road, uh, one of the more recent examples, they invested $12 million in that project. We gave them a two-year deal at 100% uh, the two years. And then the Borden, obviously the largest project, there was a $28 million investment. We gave them a seven-year deal and it was a sliding scale uh, with 100% the first three years and then it, it goes away uh, up to the seventh year uh, down to 30%. That averaged out to 65, a 65% tax break uh, each of those years if you wanted to look at the average. Um, we do have some requirements in place that uh, are in the standard agreements that the construction must start in a year be completed in two years. Obviously, they've got to keep up to date with taxes, those kinds of things. Uh, the statutes were recently changed, and that's really one of the reasons we're also looking at the existing policy to see what we might need to do to change it. Uh, the statutes were pretty dramatically changed. They took out all of the specific abatement schedules. There was a specific abatement schedule in the statute, but the legislator decided to take all of that out and let each town decide for themselves what kind of abatement they wanted to give. And you can now give it up to seven years, I'm, I'm sorry, 10 years, it used to be seven years. And then there's no minimum investment criteria in the statutes. Uh, they did add a couple of projects that can now qualify for tax incentive projects, uh, mixed use developments, uh, healthcare systems, and then permanent or transient residential developments. We went through a pretty exhaustive process to look at a whole bunch of other towns and what their policies uh, include. These are some of the towns that we looked at. Uh, basically, the bottom line was that all of these policies vary widely. They all have different provisions. Each one of them has been customized for their own individual community. So basically, there's no standardized policy amongst any of these towns. There are some commonalities, but uh, they're pretty much all over the place. So there was not any particular town that we felt we should uh, mimic. So we uh, begged, borrowed, and steal different provisions from some of these towns. In terms of uh, uh, what we recommended, um, the highlighted version that you have, uh, everything that is highlighted in yellow 
are areas uh, that we're proposing to change and update. Um, so, so the major uh, changes to the present policy, I we made you know a bunch of wordsmithing changes, so I won't get into the details of that. But we added in section two uh, some new eligible business types based on the statute. As I mentioned, mixed use development uh, is now uh, being included in our policy, health systems, and then also transient residential. Uh, section four, we added some language in terms of the criteria for when we review these tax agreements that we wanted to emphasize that uh, if there are distressed um, blighted properties, we felt those should be uh, considered as a priority for funding. And then if we have properties that we've st specifically targeted for redevelopment, that those should also be uh, considered as priority properties for getting uh, tax incentives. In section five, we modified uh, the application, application process just a little bit, but most importantly, we spell out now in that section all of the information that we expect to be submitted with an application. And most importantly, we included language that they have to provide us with a detailed financial cost benefit analysis to justify the request for the tax incentive. Uh, we do not presently have that in the policy, so we felt it's important because we have actually been requiring that now anyway. So the last few projects that have come in have had substantial documentation uh, and pro forma uh, spreadsheets spelling out how the uh, proposed tax agreement would work, what the benefits would be to the developer and what the benefits would be to the town. So it's important that we add that into the uh, policy. Uh, section six, we've added some language about the kind of language that needs to be in the final tax incentive agreement. Uh, we also think we need to come up with a standardized agreement so that we're consistent uh, with all the other projects that we've done and we're not doing, a, doing this on a case by case basis. And then we've added language specifically that uh, basically this is a guideline policy, not a regulatory policy, and that the town council at the end of the day uh, can certainly modify these agreements as they as they see fit. Um, most importantly, we're recommending changes to the actual abatement schedule. So this is the um, new recommendation. So historically, the criteria for the abatement schedule was based on the amount of money being invested by the developer. We're converting that over to, uh, we're gonna look at these tax agreements based on the increased assessed value of the property that results from the project, not just based on the amount of investment by the developer. So uh, at the end of the day, the tax incentive agreement is really giving them uh, a tax freeze based on the increased assessment, not on what the investment is in the property. So uh, that's the statutory way to do it. So we're converting over to the statutory way to do it. Uh, we're recommending that we kind of standardize um, the abatement schedule. So this is the new schedule we're suggesting. Uh, so, so the minimum uh, increased assessment that would qualify for the program would be $100,000. Previously, the language allowed uh, as low as $25,000. So we're, we're upping the bottom threshold to 100,000. Uh, the first range would be $100,000 in increased assessment up to $500,000 in increased assessment. Uh, we would make projects eligible for up to two years and a 30% um, tax break. The second schedule would be between $500,000 and $3 million. We would up that to a three-year agreement, and we would also up the percentage to 40%. The next category would be between $3 million and $7 million with a four-year agreement uh, with a 40% tax break. Uh, next one is seven to 15 million. We would up that to five-year agreement at 50% and anything over 15 million uh, would be eligible for a six-year agreement uh, at 50%. Um, we're recommending that it not actually be 50%, for example, each year but it would be the average of the agreement. So people could front load it. They could ask for 100,000 uh, the first two years, but then the last few years would be a lesser percent 
so that over the course of that agreement, uh, the percentages would average out. So we're, we're leaving this a little bit negotiable, but at the end of the day, the averages have to uh, break out to this schedule. Um, we're also playing around with the manufacturing of statute 12-65H. This is only for uh, personal property. Um, so we've tweaked this schedule a little bit uh, and this follows the statutes. Unlike the real property uh, tax assessments, the personal property tax assessments are included in the statute. So this is right out of the statutory authority. So, but it's different than what we have in place now. Uh, so we're recommending we go, we go with the statutory requirements. Uh, in terms of next steps, obviously if there's any additional revisions, we'll factor those into the policy. Uh, this still has to be reviewed by the town attorney, by the town manager. Uh, we would like the mayor to weigh in. Uh, we'd like the assessor, town assessor to weigh in, and we'd like the finance director to weigh in as we move this forward. Uh, we, we would also probably want to revise our application form. We would also recommend we draft a standardized agreement so there's no questions amongst developers going forward. And then uh, after all that's done, we would make a final recommendation to the town council, and then the town council would have a hearing and uh, would hopefully approve the uh, new schedule. I think that's the last slide. I apologize for going so quickly, but I'm more than happy to uh, answer uh, any questions anyone has on, on any of this. Cindy? Yeah, I just have a question. Um, what is transient versus permanent property in this context? So permanent residential. Or residential, would, yeah. Yeah, permanent residential would be um, I think they're distinguishing, typically they're distinguishing when they say transient versus permanent is uh, permanent being probably uh, some type of apartment, that kind of thing, versus transient being, um, I think, more of like a hotel, motel kind of scenario. Not sure why they picked that language uh, in the statute. I didn't go back in the, um, into the hearings to, to, to define that, but that's, that's, I think that's the distinction. Uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I mean, we know we have a number of motels that um, provide lodging on a temporary basis, and that would fall into the transient and they would get a tax abatement. Is that how it would work? I, I would think that would be the, that would be the distinction versus, um, for example, 275 Ridge Road you know, the multifamily building we gave the tax incentive to, that would be considered permanent residential. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, whether this would, I mean, it seems as we have enough of the transient, at least along the Berlin Turnpike. And if that's a, a factor or Or if somebody wanted to build a, you know, four or five story hotel, I yeah. guess you guys have to discuss, do you, would you, I, I would think you would consider yeah. something like that uh, for a tax break, given the investment somebody's making, so. Okay, and uh, just one other question, and then is the, uh, uh, the cost uh, benefit analysis, what's in the cost side and what's in the benefit side? So we've pretty much got a standard, um, uh, We've had a, a, recently we've had several requests and they've been consistent in terms of uh, the formula. So we require that they demonstrate in that financial analysis uh, a, a level of gap, you know, the need for some gap financing. And that's where our tax incentive uh, benefits would, would kick in. So we've had those analysis identify their entire financing um, proposal so that, uh, and then, uh, project out what the tax uh, uh, in the tax uh, benefits would be to the town uh, each year, plugging in the formula that they want. So we know uh, in general terms what kind of taxes the project is going to generate each year, and we've been doing that on a twenty-year uh, projection. So at the end of the twenty years, we have an understanding of the net benefits to the town. 
Um, and we actually require the developers to show their financial analysis uh, as it relates to the overall project. Thank you. Peter? It's, it's Paul Thompson. Um, hey, Paul. Question on those guidelines, I'm not sure where, where I think we talked about them at one point, on those, um, those guidelines and, and, uh, and rules around that, um, is there flexibility for incentivizing um, development by locally owned developers or entrepreneurs, women-owned businesses, disability, veterans, I forgot the acronym, minority-owned businesses? Is there flexibility within those rules to incentivize um, people looking to bring uh, those type of developments in? In this draft, there's not, no language that incentivizes that specifically. Uh, other towns have done that uh, in their tax um, policy statements. I'm just trying to find the slides where we talk about some of the other towns here. Um, yeah, I apologize, I'm not in front of a screen. That's okay, let me just, um, here we go, um, let's see. Yeah, so some towns, um, we obviously, um, I added language in there for blighted and underutilized properties, but some uh, communities have put in additional uh, incentives or additional benefits if they're bringing in, for example, higher wage jobs, uh, if they are adding, you know, if, uh, provisions for specific levels of minority employment, uh, things like that. So. I think Enfield, I think maybe Windsor are two of uh, the communities that have added uh, that type of criteria because obviously they feel uh, that's an important part of their economic development strategy is to add that type of employment. But this draft does not have any language to that effect. As I said, it has you know, emphasis on blighted properties being converted or targeted properties being converted, but not not the kind of things you asked about. Yeah, and and I think you know uh, just you know my comment on uh, it's it's a laudable effort to try and tie it to job creation uh, in general or to specific um, metrics like employment of minorities and whatnot. Those are those are just difficult to measure and keep after after time. I I would think a good start on that front might be something along the lines of if we could do something for incentivization on women, minority owned, veterans, disabled, and locally owned or, or locally based um, might be something if we could include it if we're not too late in the game. No, we're, we're certainly not too late in the game. We're not on any particular um, timeline or schedule. We've been talking about updating this policy for, for quite a while. So uh, would be uh, so, so it would be helpful if others wanted to weigh in on that. So I get some, some guidance on that. Can we do that by email? We can, certainly, yep. All right, cool, thanks. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Any other questions, guys, from Peter? Okay, Pete, thank you uh, on that. Uh, let's get to the Celestine Highway. Um, I was lucky enough to attend a um, meeting. Uh, was it yesterday, Peter, or the day before yesterday? Yesterday. Day, yesterday. Um, uh, with Gary and Peter and members of the DOT. And it was to talk about the Salestine Highway. Um, and because, as you know, that's a state road. Um, and to find out and get some uh, insight um, into some of the complexities that the Salstein Highway offers, the pros and cons, and it was very eye-opening for me. I won't say that um, uh, it wasn't, it was eye-opening in the sense of uh, the amount of detail, which was great. Um, I wasn't that happy, candidly, about what they had to share with respects to some of the things that we've been talking about with regards to Salstein Highway. Um, the the door isn't shut on everything, but they they were very specific. And if you, was that meeting recorded, Peter? No, um, no. Wasn't, um, 
Well, at one point I addressed the group and said they've done a very good job on showing us from a, a safety perspective in uh, predominantly safety perspective, views on what could be done and not done on the Southstein Highway. And I then asked, I said, based on what you have experience with with other communities, um, what can we do? Um, and that list was a lot shorter than the stuff that we that they felt we couldn't do. Um, and what I th that I'm giving you kind of a, a 30,000 foot view on it. Um, Peter, I know you took copious notes on that with regards to some of the things that we talked about uh, with regards, but why don't you give, if you don't mind, just breathe a little life into some of the issues that they had um, regarding Silestine Highway. So I guess to, to set the conversation, they reminded us that uh, the Silestein Highway, when there's any issues on, on the interstate, is the main, you know, al alternate route to get between Hartford and Rocky Hill and elsewhere. Therefore, um, improvements that would potentially uh, conflict with traffic flow uh, would have to be highly justified uh, in order to, you know, make it through the DOT's review review process. So, with that in mind, um, you know, anything that might create conflicts. Uh, would uh, be reviewed in, in that regard, uh, critically at least. Um, specifically, we talked about things like adding landscaping trees, uh, and they explained to us there's something called a clear zone. Therefore, any new landscaping would have to be put outside of the clear zone, which basically puts uh, new plantings on private property rather than within the Public right of way, so they have to. They would be set behind the, behind the cur behind the sidewalks. For example, um, we talked about putting, you know, divider islands, landscaped islands in the middle of the uh, highway to, you know, provide some beautification. Maybe also uh, act as traffic calming. They immediately s explained how that would work. They would all have to be highly protected. You know, they would be the town would have to assume maintenance responsibilities and liability. Um, those are two examples of the kind of feedback that we got when we started to get into uh, specifics. Um, so uh, as Mark said, they did a great job of telling us um, what we can't do, but not as great of a job as telling us what we could do. So, uh, I mean, this was a kickoff meeting. Um, you know, there's gonna be additional meetings uh, to follow up. Um, and, and now we now know who the key people are that we have to talk to and who we need to work with going forward. So um, we'll see what, what comes, comes out of it. But it's, it was not, uh, their response was not unexpected. Um, we've heard this you know, from them uh, before. Um, and and you know, they talked about the criteria that they would review because of the high traffic volumes on our portion of the Silestine Highway versus the portion in Rocky Hill. Um, there would be different considerations made um, between Rocky Hill section and our section because of our higher traffic volumes. With the lower traffic volume, Peter, was the point on the Rocky Hill West Hill line with 91 South or 91 um, uh, dumps there going South. It was, it was, uh, I know we talked about a road diet that way was more feasible versus our way where the traffic pretty much was dumping and going uh, north towards Hartford. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. they made the distinction, you know, that below 18 or 20,000 vehicle trips uh, or above 20,000 is the one of the cutoffs for that criteria. So um, in the Rocky Hill section, uh, they indicate it was below that and our section was in some cases much higher than that. One of the things to try to help um, uh, our case, if you will, whatever that case ends up being, was to ask whether or not um, they could measure um, uh, the amount of people that are using the Southstein Highway to go from Rocky Hill, say, to Hartford versus using 91. Um, and I got kind of a, it was an interesting slash creepy response. They said they're doing stuff now with people's cell phones and whatnot that they can find out based on cell phones where people live. I forget what the actual study was called, Peter. They had a good name for it. 
um, but where they we could actually figure out whether or not people were using the Southstein Highway instead of 91. Um, and that, you know, if you build it or if you unbuild it, will they come? That if you restricted the Southstein Highway, would more people use 91 um, type of a scenario, which is kind of the angle I was looking at. Um, they said that test, that is something that they could do. It was fairly new technology, but I think they were literally just starting to use that technology. Um, but again, to paraphrase, Peter's paraphrasing me, and I'm going to paraphrase Peter. Um, they gave us a lot more no's on what we can't do versus options on what we can do. But the, the good news is, if you will, we didn't go into this meeting looking for uh, solid yeses or no's on anything. It was just kind of, a, as Peter said, find out who the players are. Um, there were people who I'd never met before. And I think some people that Peter or Gary hadn't met before either, just so we know that as we decide to look at, at focuses on South Dean Highway, who are the people that we would need to communicate uh, with in the future. So although they express things, yes and no, um, you know, we didn't get to a point where we pressed any issues either way on, on what we wanted to do. Um, but it was a, you know, it was a, it's a concrete step that had to be taken. So I'm glad that we took it. Um, um, you know, sometimes you don't get what you want to hear, obviously, uh, but uh, it was a good step, at least on getting uh, um, information. So we, we don't end up spinning our wheels, or I should say, we end up investing our time on things that we can actually focus on and do. Any questions on Southstein Highway? Did, did anything come up in the meeting about the traffic signaling project in Rocky Hill and how that was chosen and why, if we have much more traffic on the Silestine than they do in Weathersfield than they do in Rocky Hill, why would they commit those funds to Rocky Hill? It was, uh, it was based on the age of the uh, signal improvements um, and they have a schedule for those kinds of things. So uh, we asked them to look into uh, the upcoming schedule for any of our signals here in town. So uh, we, we threw a bunch of things back at them that we're going to now wait for responses to. And that, that was, that was one of them. Um, our town engineer uh, at the last minute had a family emergency, so he couldn't be part of the conversation. So uh, we, we left that out there that he needs to be uh, at the table for our next meeting as he, he better than I talks their, their language. So but there are um, there were specific um, specific reasons why certain intersections you know had been recently done. For example, the town line um, intersection and then the following intersection on the other side in Rocky Hill had recently been um, redone. So um, so I think they're going to go down the rest of the highway corridor at periods of time and do that. They just couldn't share um, with us the schedule. Are they concerned at all about, you know, specifically the Rocky Hill Weathersfield border and the Weathersfield Hartford border, how pedestrian unfriendly those two areas are and how they would be able to make that better? We specifically asked about both of those. They did not give us any specific answers. Um, but we did throw that on there as uh, future agenda items to be discussing. Um, the improvements at those two locations would be significant in order to improve pedestrian access there because there are no, um, you, you got those high speed on ramps and high speed off ramps. So you would be talking about not just adding sidewalks, you'd be talking about potential signalization and other kinds of things that traffic would have to stop in order for pedestrians to get through both of those stretches. So those would be big. Uh, projects, but they may be on, you know, a longer term plan um, that uh, everybody at the meeting wasn't aware of yet. So uh, that will certainly be a part of our continuing conversation with them and was identified. Cindy? Yeah, was it brought up? Um, it, it sounds like the vision of the DOT is that the main mission of this highway, this state highway, is to handle offload traffic from I-91, I mean, is there any kind of sense of balance between this is our main commercial district, it has multi-purpose uses, and we want to try to extend those to pedestrians and, you know, just commercial enterprises? Yeah, that's why we had Mark there, you know, to set the tone that 
you know, we're looking at this from an economic development point of view, as well as a traffic and pedestrian uh, point of view. So that message was was conveyed conveyed to them. So I think until until we propose specific improvements, they can't really respond in any obviously any specific way and say yes or no. So um, and we're not clearly at, we were just really getting we're we're dipping our toe in the water and testing the water to see what general responses we would get from them. And as I, as I said at the beginning, they were not unexpected. Uh, the DOT um, still looks at these as, you know, traffic corridors rather than, you know, multi-use um, facilities that need to accommodate, you know, the whole concept of uh, complete streets and, you know, all of that is, I think, still relatively new to the to the DOT, but um, uh, we did talk about whether they would support us studying the entire corridor and looking at all aspects of that. So that was one of the uh, questions we posed to them to give further uh, thought to, uh, if we could do that in partnership. So um, we left a lot of things on the table um, and did not push anything specifically. So I, we think everything's still on the table uh, for future conversations. And, and so what's ahead in terms of future meetings? Is this, are they committing to any kind of regular communication? Uh, we, we they designated two forward? people to be uh, the contacts going forward. And we uh, didn't set up a follow-up, but definitely um, indicated that we will be getting back in touch with them relatively soon to, to have a, some follow-up conversations. I think what we want to do, Cindy, is probably within the next week or so is to establish another meeting uh, with the interested parties um, and it, it certainly have Pete and Pete there and or Gary and and maybe at one point even Peter try to get one of the two reps uh, from DOT on the call so you guys can hear it directly from them. And the Department of Transportation is just that they're not the they're not into economic development or anything else. They're just like you said, they're about transportation and that's all they look at that's their focus um and uh, you know it's up to us to try to uh, pivot wherever we can um to try to do what we can to help support business and or um mobility issues on and access on the south Dean highway and again it was a soft meeting it really they i think as peter said they kind of got our drift from an economic development perspective that there is concern about the south Dean highway um, access and um, um, uh, property value, et cetera. And the question I pose to them is that you need to help us and work with us on things that we can do um, uh, versus the things that we can't do. Uh, and I don't, I, they said that was a very good question, which I don't know what that means in those, in those meetings. Uh, they go, oh, that's a very good question. So um, I don't know if that was good or bad, but I did get a attaboy on a, a good question. Um, but we will, I think we should convene uh, again now that we've had this meeting. And as I said, Cindy, and to others that have been um, involved with this, we really wanted, you know, my focus is to be realistic and, and do the things that we can do. Uh, but we need to understand what the rules are and, and who the players are. And that's what that meeting was about. Any other questions on South Steen Highway? Yeah. One, oh, one, thing, one thing I would throw out to everybody in your travels throughout the rest of the state, if you see something, um, you know, like we're trying to accomplish here on the Silestine Highway uh, on another highway corridor uh, somewhere else in the state, and you think it's a state highway, please let me know. And uh, we can use those examples um, in our future conversations with them. If you've seen things on state highways that you know, have, have resulted in traffic calming or beautification and those kinds of things. Uh, those are always good things to have up our sleeve uh, to use so that we can understand why it why it's okay there and why it might not be okay here or vice versa. So if you've seen that kind of stuff out there, I know we talked about Glastonbury, but I'm talking about elsewhere uh, in the state. Um, please, please keep your eyes open as you are out and about. I think Whitney Avenue, um, I'll, I'll check it out in uh, New Haven. I think there's a fairly large effort ongoing um, to you know, look at the uh, multiple roles that it plays. 
I'm pretty yeah, sure it's a state highway. There, yeah, that's that's what I'm not aware of whether or not that's a state highway. But I think I read about Whitney Ave is that their traffic their traffic count was above twenty thousand per day. Is you know, and so that 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 was I know it's a different kind of a it's a different kind of a street than the Silestein Highway is, but um, but I just I was struck by what the traffic count was, and and that I think there's this perception with the Silestein is that you need it to be a five lane road because of all the traffic. And there are plenty of roads in the state that are just two lane, you know, divided highway um, that can handle that number of cars regularly. Um, but there's just this perception that it needs to be that wide. And it does, it strikes me as being really ridiculous that in, you know, in the two or three times a year where there is a traffic accident where we need to get people to get into Hartford on the Silestine Highway that we're just going to, um, that, that we're going to accommodate that by having a, like a five lane road in the middle of our town. So, I mean, I, you know, I know engineers are engineers and they're gonna say whatever they say, but I, I think that kind of method of thinking is slowly, slowly changing, but it is like trying to turn a freight train around. So was, uh, I, I get it. You bring up one good point, Tom, and, and Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, as I often am. Um, the One of the things that they said they had concerns with the amount of turns off the Southstein Highway into businesses and they had talked about maybe, um, and this is kind of master plan stuff on, on getting stretches where instead of it within a hundred yards, there being three or four businesses that would turn in, you could consolidate one central area that would go in for businesses and mitigate the number of areas where people turn in. And that was their issue is that there was not a lot of a shoulder on our property. And on top of that, from a pedestrian perspective, with people turning off the South State Highway to go into different businesses that if you increase pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk, you've got to be very mindful with the number of cars that are turning off the South State Highway to go into businesses uh, on the South State Highway, which I thought was interesting. Um, but I, I, I think the we will find out um, what we can do and what we can't do, um, I think, very shortly. Um, but the, your comments are certainly welcome, Tom, and I get it. Just, just one other one other footnote on that, Mark. They also mentioned that when the highway was widened 25 years or so ago, the DOT proposed some medians, um, and the town and the merchants were vehemently opposed to that kind of yeah, improvement. I'm going to try and dig up and see what that plan specifically, you know, had laid out. Uh, so I understand that more, but they 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 specifically said the town did not want that and was fighting against it. And you know, obviously, I reminded them it, that was 25 or 30 years ago, and you know, times change and philosophies change. But I thought that was interesting um, that you know they pointed to the town as not, and now the town's coming back and asking them to think about that again. And then one last thing, um, they tend to look at making changes when they are scheduled to either repave or restripe the highway. So we're, we think that that is about five years away. They're gonna check and see what that schedule is um, because that's when they would most likely be able to make whatever changes uh, that they would be agreeable to. So we also have to be thoughtful about that. I I think there's also just, I'm having a philosophical problem with the DOT viewing the mission of the Silestine Highway as serving I-91. And I think it, it kind of creates a causation. The more amenable it is to fast traffic, the more it serves as an alternative to I-91 and the less it helps our town. So, I mean, how bad is it to go from say Rocky Hill, you know, over to Hartford? I mean, if there's stop and go traffic, if you're gonna have stop and go traffic in Weathersfield anyhow, what's the real advantage? No, they didn't, they didn't say they would not consider any of the things we were discussing. It's just that we needed to hear from them that, you know, they do look at this is whether you like it or not, you know, an alternative when there's problems on the interstate and they need to, look at that up and down the uh, the interstate corridors. So uh, it was not an absolute no, it was just they wanted to put everything in context and understand from their perspective uh, that this does serve 
multiple roles and one of them, uh, and they are the DOT, uh, that they have to be thinking about that. So until such time as we start putting specifics on the table, we really didn't, we didn't get, we didn't get no's, we didn't get yeses. Uh, we've started a conversation um, and you know, they're hearing where we're coming from, we're hearing where they're coming from. So um, it's just a, an initial kickoff as far as I'm concerned. Well, thanks Peter and Mark for getting it started. <laughs> Uh, you're welcome. And, and you use the word philosophical. You're having a philosophical I issue. Engineers are not philosophers. Um, so that's the issue. Um, so you have to get out of your philosophical point of view, Cindy, in order to, to get it. Well, I guess a, just a point of view. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Um, any other questions on this? All right, guys. Peter, a CIP? Just um, on that note, uh, we heard on Friday that there's a a grant, a grant, new grant funding out there for affordable housing plans. We had asked for some CIP money um, to help with the plan of development and to carve out some money. So just a, an FYI, we may be able to stretch our CIP dollars a little bit further now. Uh, we're going to file that grant tomorrow and uh, should know relatively soon um, if we um, can uh, get that additional $15,000. So that might help to have more money towards a Silestine Highway study or the plan of conservation and development. So just uh, just be aware of that. Great. Anything else on that, Peter? That's it for me. Great. Um, I, Mr. Evans, I don't think is joining us today. Is that correct? I didn't see him on the call. Okay. We'll have to bypass that for the moment. Um, Mr. Penlow, I know that we're past the two o'clock. I assume that he is gone. I think we got, we heard from, um, from Patrick on what he wanted to speak to us regarding the budget, which I, at the, candidly, I think was a win for us. Um, um, getting the 50,000 for the new employee and getting the, keeping that 50,000 CIP, I think was really good. I think we got, I think we dodged um, uh, some bullets. And I think they, um, in talking to the mayor, I'm not talking out of school, I'm just sharing what he shared. I think some of the money, the ARP money that they were talking about will find its way to EDIC RDA. Um, um, so anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, PNZ, PNZ chairman. You're on mute, my friend. George, you're, on, you're on mute, George, you're on mute. There you go. Nope. Nope. I still can't hear you. Anyone, can anyone read lips? There we go. You're good, George. Okay. I didn't hit it hard. Yeah. Uh, no, the, uh, there's nothing much that I can report beyond what Peter is. Peter, I, I wanted to bring up something with you because I, I could call you on the phone, but uh, I understand the, the commission is taking up uh, Leo's Pizza. Parking on Tuesday, is that correct? Yes. I want to talk to you about uh, what we can do about that whole area and you and the manager. And I mean, you can front for me on that one if you want. Um, but I'm concerned with uh, the parking, trucking, parking in the area and the lack of it. Remember, this is an older location. I'd also wonder if the possibility resides in uh, tax abatement there with the investment that's being made in that parking area behind. So uh, I, I'd like to get more into that, but uh, with you, perhaps I thought I should call you on the phone. Okay. And that's about all I have to report because there really hasn't been too much at the commission meetings. We haven't held one recently. All right. Council George, thank you very much, sir. Um, that brings us on to tourism. Are you still with us, Judy? I guess Judy Keene is, uh, is not with us at the moment as well. So we'll have to take a check. Peter, do you have anything to add or anything that you think Judy may have shared on tourism? Um, just uh, the um, Webb Dean Stevens 
um, visitor center ex exhibit space. They had a ribbon cutting uh, last Friday for that. Um, turned out very great. So if you haven't had a chance to pop in there and check it out, you'll be very, uh, very impressed. The Bicycles on Main Street event was a wild success, uh, a really low cost, but well done um, event. We're getting phone calls from all sorts of other towns, you know, who now want to have their own Bicycles on Main uh, event. Um, so I, the merchants, uh, I, I'm attending a shopkeepers meeting tonight to talk about the event, but they're also planning an event in August, the Porch Fest with the music that they did uh, two years ago. So that's probably going to be coming back as another event in um, in uh, in late August. Um, those are probably the uh, the uh, slip away river tours at the Cove. Uh, they've they've reopened for the season. So if anyone's interested in getting out in the river, uh, they are now back as of I think earlier this week or this past weekend. Right. Um, the Herbert Dunham stuff here. So it's music down there this year. Uh, they're going to do the um, they're also going to do the Keeney Cooler concerts in July. Uh, so that's coming uh, as well. So those are probably the main highlights. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Chamber. Miss Raymond. Hi. Hi. So we had our first networking event last night past COVID, which was great. We had a Wethersfield Country Club and um, it, it was great to see people in person and everybody, as you could tell by the way they were inter interacting. I did get to meet Bonnie from the uh, Donut D um, Depot as well. She's awesome. And they're hoping to open up at the end of July, she said. If anybody knows of any high school kids that need part-time jobs for the summer, they're looking desperately to hire. So keep that in mind, showing me to pass that on. Um, last night, we also had a changing of the guard. We have a new president. Uh, Christine Orsini uh, has done her two-year term and Pat DePerry now is the uh, new chamber president. Um, we are working on some uh, events and uh, the beer and barbecue will be back, date to be determined for availability of the barn. Um, we're having a car show in September and uh, Business After Hours is opening up again. In fact, we have one for July and one for August set up and I'll be sending that out to everybody. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, the Charles is having their ribbon cutting on uh, next Tuesday. The 15th, the ribbon cutting is at three. He's having uh, from three to five. If you can't make it at three, stop down. He's gonna have hors d'oeuvres, beer and wine for everybody. So it's his one year anniversary. So it'd be great if everybody could attend. So so things are opening up again. Um, I, I have a question about the donut station. They, they said they're looking for people, but how are they letting folks know that they're looking for people? Because I've actually been looking for some sort of a notice saying that they're hiring because I have a 16 year old who probably won't want to work there, but I'm trying to encourage her. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to, I do an employment addition for uh, the chamber e-blast. So I'm going to be putting it in there. I, I'm not sure. I'll ask her how else she's doing. Yeah. That, but, Cause but if I, the chamber was going to share something like that, that might be a good idea. If, if they're, yeah. If, um, they're, that, that, yeah. That's going to go out next week, the beginning of next week. She's going to send me the specifics on that. I can let you know what they are directly. Um, I think you're just angling for a donut discount is my is my feeling. It's whatever you got to do. Yeah, I hear you. It's tough out there. She's really um, energetic. She's going to be a great addition to the to our community. Thank you, Deb. Anything else? Um, that's it for me. Great. Thank you. Um, I have nothing to report. Uh, subcommittee, I know we just met financial strategies, and I'm glad we're making our tax uh, incentive program move forward. Marketing communications, Peter, anything? I can't think of anything from a marketing perspective that we need to look at um, other than, you know, maybe addressing, as you said, the 55. When do we get to, uh, when are we going to start to look at the 55 responses uh, from our um, reach, our outreach? Uh, we can, we could, we could set up a marketing meeting and then, you know, give us a deadline so that okay. would help move it along. So, well, um, we'll schedule, I, I can't do it now, but we'll yep. schedule a point where we can get to that because it'd be good to look at that data. Yep. Um, 
If you guys would take a moment and look at Don's uh, great work with regards to minutes, if you would take a moment and review the minutes. Any questions on the minutes? We have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Uh, thank second. you, Councilor uh, Martino. Second? Second. Mr. Penelo, thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I usually say this is the part of the program. Aye. But, oh, aye. Thank you. Aye. Aye. That's, a, that's a late <laughs> aye, but well done. Um, uh, our next meeting is Thursday, July 8th. <laughs> Uh, 2021, um, I I'm, was thinking about uh, what June 10th uh, last year uh, was like um, and thinking about the Charles opening up um, during um, a really tough time uh, and that they're there and they've been wildly successful. So um, it's just great to see. It's nice to be June 10th to 2021 and not 2020, that's for sure. Um, right? Make a motion to adjourn. Mark, before before we adjourn, what you the council and the board of ed are now meeting again in person. So I, I don't know if you're in terms of your next meeting, you want to keep uh, Zoom meetings or you want to go back in person. How many people are wearing pants now? I think would be the <laughs> but is there going to be lunch or no lunch? I mean, I, yeah, that's there's all no I mean. lunch. You cut the budget. Who the hell wants to come there now? Um, I, you know, I was waiting for somebody to make a remark and my money was on Pentalo. So I won the pool. I won the pool. Um, I, I don't, our lunches haven't been officially cut as of yet. Um, but, um, if I'm, I'm off for meeting in person, if you guys are good with that, um, what are your thoughts? If you give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, if you like it, I'm, I'm up. We good. All right, thumbs up. Um, so Peter, we, it would be great if we can meet. Where is the town hall? It's on the South Dean Highway somewhere, right? I'll, I'll look for it. It's across from the donut place. That's what I heard. We uh, could meet in the council chamber so we have more room to spread out. So that's a that, that's an option as a compromise. Sure. And guys, if anybody has any concerns, should we just have an opportunity where people can zoom in? We can still set up a, a screen for people who want to zoom in, I would assume, Peter. No, it's unfortunate we don't have the ability to do both at the same time. So it's okay. one or the other. All what right. about a call-in number, though, Peter? What, is, is that possible, like a conference call line in case? You know, yeah, we probably we probably could do that. Um, so that would be an option if people okay. still are uncomfortable. Uh, I, I, I think we can move the conference uh, phone into the council chambers. If, if you had a, a laptop, though, are you served by a Wi-Fi in the council chambers? Yep, we are. Yep. Wouldn't that uh, facilitate a Zoom meeting? Um, I don't know how that would work in the council chambers, but um, if we were at a table, you could just put the laptop down like it was a person at the table, I guess. Well, we have we have a month to figure, a month it, out, to figure so. it out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So we'll try and do uh, in person and or a hybrid of that. All right, everyone, thank you for your time. Um, the motion adjourned. Um, I'm gonna say if you are in, you can now turn off your computer. Adios. Ciao. Bye.